Foster Cave and I'm Powered Trini. Strength for the powerless. Courage for the fearful. Hope and healing for wounded hearts. Hi, and welcome back to Foster Care, an unparalleled journey with Jason and no Amanda. Sorry, guys, but you miss out on the pretty one today. She's not feeling well. She's been been under the weather with a little bit of a stomach bug. So she opted out today and I let her because, well, I don't want a stomach bug too. Let's be fair. Today's guest, we're going to have Ruben J on here. I met Ruben online and he has a story to tell us about foster care. And that's part of what we love to do here is to talk about the foster care system talk about people's experience in it because number one, we need more homes and I'd love to inspire somebody to figure out how to become a good foster home. That'd be awesome. Number two, a lot of people have been through the foster care system. We have almost a half of a million kids in foster care right now. And if you can tell your story to a kid and you can give them a little bit of inspiration, that's even better. Number three, there are a lot of people who have been in foster care who have had absolutely horrible situations. And I'm willing to talk about that as well, because those are the things we need to talk about and bring to light and be honest about so that we can overcome that in today's system. So Ruben, how are you doing today, man? Jason, I am doing extremely well. How are you? Oh man, I'm, I'm busy as can be with, with my wife under the weather. I am Mr. Mom. I am Mr. Dad. I am Mr. Fix the car. Oh wait, no, I didn't. I couldn't figure that one out. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> run around make lunch make dinner all that good dad stuff you know I, and don't get me wrong I love it we, we do a lot of the dad stuff it's fun but it is a busy day for sure hopefully your day is going a little bit calmer it, it's so much calmer out here Sundays are usually my days where I take a few minutes uh, to, to relax you know Monday through Saturday I'm I'm busier than a one-armed paper hanger as they say uh, and, and Sundays you know what I'm going to take, a, take at least a five-minute break at some point. So that's that's what I do. Well, <laughs> after I got done with the, half my day's chores, I did take a shower. So we're going to call that a break, right? Yeah, there you go. Perfect. That's that's exactly, you know, when my friends say take a break, I'm like, I just I just went to the bathroom. I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about? Like, a break? What is a break? <laughs> <laughs> I have six kids running around the house. Actually, five today. No, four. Yeah, I have four today. I, I lose track. I, I haven't, I haven't I lost like- any of them. I feel like you've eliminated them one by one as the story just progressed. <laughs> I had to think. One is at a friend's house. One's out camping. Um, yeah, so I have one, two, I have four in the house. I yeah, it's it's not confusing at all, right? We have this many. <laughs> I don't have any, so I don't know. So, <laughs> oh, would you like a few? Uh, not not currently. I appreciate it, but uh, plus I wouldn't know how to get them out here. So, you have you seen the, the boxes where they just write "live animal" on the side, just nail it shut. <laughs> Yes. A couple of protein bars. I'll make it. Oh yeah. Perfect. That sounds good. It sounds like, like an expensive, uh, expensive delivery from UPS. <laughs> yeah, buddy. But yeah, no, it's, it's been busy out here and, and, um, the, we're actually having some kind of LA like weather out here in the middle of Missouri today. Is that a good thing? We have not had, we, we've had rain for ever now. I think I don't remember. It's been like two weeks of nasty rain. So the fact that we've had a little sunshine has just been amazing. So I know you guys get it all the time. Sunshine or rain? Cause we, I don't think it's rained here since like 1992. <laughs> sunshine. Yeah. And I think it was out there in 98 and I think that's when it rained. And you know, that, that sounds right. Cause I was alive when the last time it rained. So for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I was stationed in California. Actually I was stationed up in Monterey. So a little bit up the coast from you there, but but yeah, California is a, a neat. Station as in like uh, military? Yeah. Oh, uh, thank you for your service. Oh, hey man, it was my pleasure. I had a blast, and you know, we we got to tell it. Well, we don't tell the stories, most of them, but we got to have fun out there. <laughs> we, we had a great time. But uh, but yeah, so uh, I know you're from the LA area out there, and um, you've done a, a handful of things in your life since um since having to gone off into into your uh your childhood. But let's start back there. Way back in the beginning, um, how old were you when you came into foster care? I was uh, I was six weeks old uh, when I was I was taken from my my biological mother, uh, who I will refer to as Angela, um, which is her legal name. Uh, so it's a good good way to go. yep, yeah, it's a good way to ref, you know reference her as. But yeah, no, I was I was six weeks old when I was taken out of her her care and and placed into. Uh, I think it was I spent a, a week in uh, what they call Orangewood out here in in Orange County. Uh, it's like the uh, the foster care home, like 
it's kind of like I call it like jail for foster kids. Uh, and I was there for like a week and then placed in the foster care shortly thereafter. Okay. Okay. Why, why were you taken out of, out of your home? Oh, this is a, this is actually quite, quite a fun story. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a criminal. I was a criminal at six weeks old. Oh man. Uh, and so what I, what I would like to do, if it's cool with you, is kind of tell a little bit of a backstory of who my biological mom was that will set this story as to why I was taken up even, even a, a notch further. Uh, so long story short, my mother, uh, was, uh, born and raised in uh, my biological mom, Angela, she was born and raised in, in Texas and, uh, somehow got into, uh, a child prostitution ring down in Texas. Uh, and at the age of 12, one of the Johns got her pregnant and took her from Texas, brought her to California where she had her first kid and then spent the next eight years, uh, having children. Oh, wow. And so uh, my oldest biological brother that I know of uh, is actually, I, you know, long story short, we were adopted together, the three of us, uh, my two older brothers and myself. Uh, him and my, my middle brother were taken from her after uh, they lived under a bridge and, and they, were, they were found to be homeless. So the county took them uh, away from her and she was on drugs and doing all this crazy stuff. And then the person who ended up adopting us started the adoption process on the two of them. Excuse me. And then at some point through the process, the County's like, Hey, we need to stop this for a second. because there's a third child, uh, who was just taken out of custody and we want to see if we can put the three boys together. And so my adopted mom at the time, you know, at the time was like, okay, let me know what's up. So that that's where that happened. Uh, my mother, uh, Angela was uh, the getaway driver of an armed robbery. Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, I happened to be an accomplice of that because I was in the back seat. Oh, my. So you, you got a criminal record at, at a very young age. Um, that's, that's six weeks. <laughs> I think that makes you an OG, doesn't it? I believe so. I, 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 I don't want to take that credit on, but I believe I believe it does. Wow. Wow. That's insane. We've heard lots of stories. I don't think I've heard that one yet. I'm, I'm glad to be a first. Uh, you know, it, it could have been, I mean, there's a lot of situations where you think about it and that's like, oh, dude, like your mom was a drug addict. Like, are you a drug baby? Like, no, I'm not. Well, thank God I'm not a drug baby. Uh, thank God I wasn't, you know, uh, a prostitution baby or anything like that. Uh, I just happened to be sitting in the backseat of a getaway car that <laughs> of an armed robbery. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, well, as, as we've talked before, uh, we've got lots of kids from lots of situations. And I know kids who, who've been in, put in those situations who've been probably less than a couple feet away from the bullets as they fly. So in an armed robber, you, you had to have been in a fairly high level of danger there, even though you obviously didn't know it at six weeks. But yeah, wow, that's, that's, that's a dangerous place. Um, so you came into care and were you guys adopted pretty quickly thereafter? No. So I was put into, into the foster care system. Uh, I honestly, my, my story of, of foster care is like best case scenario, no problems. I was in one home who ended up adopting me. It was a really smooth, smooth process for the most part. Uh, it took two and a half years for that process to, or a year and a half, I think, to begin again uh, because they weren't sure what the plans were going to be. Uh, if I was going to be adopted with the, with my two other brothers, or if I was going to be placed into a different foster home or back with my biological mother. So it took a while before we got to the, the point of the adoption process rolling. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So were you the youngest of the, of the three? I, I, I am the youngest of the three. Uh, but I'm somewhere in the middle of all the children that, that Angela ended up having. <laughs> wow. Do you have any connection with those other kids? I have a connection with one uh, that I have got reconnected a couple years ago. Uh, she's out in Texas. And long story short, things went really well. I flew out to Texas, spent a couple days with her. We got along really well. Uh, and then just kind of fell out of the wayside after a couple of years and and uh you know we don't we don't communicate as often if at all anymore but it's it's you know the communication's open if if it needed to be there 
Wow. Yeah. That, that's uh, that's quite a, an experience, I'm sure. So do you have much of a relationship with your mom today? Uh, Angela? Yes. With Angela. Sorry. Yeah. No, none whatsoever. Um, I, I was young enough. So it's a, it's a weird story um, to, to think that I was young enough to not have any memories of, of being with, you know, with Angela. It's the reason why I don't really refer to her as, as my mother is because I have no connection to her. don't have any uh, desire to be connected with her outside of the possibility of knowing a little bit more about my medical history uh, and about like, Hey, you know, does, does your family have, you know, the history of testicular, testicular, whatever, uh, you know, cancer of the male genitalia that I need to worry about or something, you know, uh, that's the only kind of thing that I would want to know. Uh, so yeah, no, I don't really have, I don't have any, any connection with, with Angela whatsoever. Okay. Yeah. Cause some kids do, some kids don't. Did you, now let me ask you this question. Did you have much of a, of that growing up? Did you have that curiosity or did you make up stories? Cause I have a little guy right now. He's Twitch is how old. Yeah. Sean, my, my age leaving my head here. Um, Twitch is five years old right now and he'll tell you stories about his mom. And earlier we were watching, we were talking about, Hey, you guys going to sit down and watch a movie while I go record this. And I said, have you guys seen all seen surfs up and they start talking about the penguins and swimming and all that. Oh yeah, we've seen that. And and he pipes up with my mommy used to swim with the penguins and all that. And she told me this whole story. Frankie left his home. Uh, well, he left the hospital, not with his mother and he's never lived with her. He, he left and, and actually after a, a withdrawals that he went through a whole um, period of, of uh, methadone wean down. And then he went to a family member's place for a day and they said well he can't handle a drug addicted baby coming off of meth because this is too much and he ended up on our house and he's been here ever since so he was probably less than two and a half weeks old he's been here the whole time he's never actually to his memory met his mother other than a couple in, uh, infant visits when he was in foster care but he has a story he'll tell you stories about his mom he will tell you stories about his dad he will tell you stories about his grandpa and I hear those from time to time. And I've heard a lot of psychologists talk about how kids tend to make these stories up about kind of their ideal parents that they, they assume, you know, something happened to them and they're coming back from all that kind of psychological piece that, that, that happens in kids. Did you experience a lot of that, that idealistic views of who your, who your biological parents were? No, uh, for, for me, here's the, Again, I, I feel like I had the best case scenario when it comes to this stuff. I I, I didn't know that I was adopted until a little bit later in, in my childhood. I was, I think, eight or nine when I found out that I was adopted. So up until that point, I had believed that the people I lived with my entire life were my parents. Uh, granted, they happened to be in their 50s when they adopted us, <laughs> you know. Uh, so there was a little bit of like a looking around and seeing my, my friend's parents being in their like twenties and thirties and like, you know, my mom being close to her sixties and just being like, that doesn't make some, too much sense, but who cares? It's my parents, you know? So lucky, luck, I think luckily for me, I, I didn't have that, uh, you know, that issue uh, or, or creativity per se, uh, because for me growing up in the, in the family I did, that was my family. And even after I found out I was adopted, I was already, for me, it's like, you're adopted. Okay, cool. Mom, can I have a sandwich? You know, <laughs> like, it didn't make a difference for me. Spoken like a true boy. <laughs> <laughs> and my, my brother, on the other hand, I believe he had a lot of that where he, he you know, he was older when he was taken away and uh, obviously went through a longer period in foster care and had those visitations. And, and he had a memory of Angela who it would then, in my opinion, trigger years of torment in his teenage years up until his early early adulthood where he assumed that the grass was greener on the other side of that fence uh, even though the story there is you know your, your biological mom it was a drug addict who uh, you know got impregnated by at least a dozen different guys at some point in her life uh, probably isn't the best person today now, now, do you have any idea who your biological father is? None whatsoever. Have you ever thought about doing the 23andMe or the Ancestor or any of those sorts of things just to see what you can find out? I kind of, I thought about it. Um, 
I part of me is like, this is an FBI ran program. I don't want the FBI having my, my DNA uh, voluntarily. <laughs> um, but, uh, I, you know, I'm more curious about the possibility of reconnecting with siblings uh, as opposed to trying to re- reconnect or connect with parents. Um, because, you know, if, if I can, if I can deviate here for a quick second, uh, you know, my mom, my adopted mom, her name's Paula. Uh, she had six kids of her own. Uh, and again, was in her mid fifties, late fifties when she adopted us. Uh, and so our older, like she had six kids of her own. And then my, my brother is her oldest of the adopted. So between her oldest adopted and her youngest biological, there's at least a 30 year difference between the two. And to be frank, most of the six, one of them's passed away uh, and the remaining five, only two of them really like to keep us in the loop since my mom's passed away and like to connect with us. So I've always thought to myself, you know what? It would be nice to have a family after my family's gone, (laughs) you know? Uh, So I've thought about the 23 and me to hopefully connect with a brother or sister here and there. Uh, but I've never actually pulled the trigger on it. Well, that's an age gap and quite an experience, you know? Yeah, yeah. it's like having two completely different families in, in reality. Um, it's weird because, uh, you know, I tell people all the time, like, listen, I'm the youngest of nine children. I'm the youngest of three children. And then I'm somewhere in the middle between eight and 12 children. And they look at me like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I have like a really crazy family dynamic. <laughs> <laughs> now, does that give you the young child, you know, the, the, the little kid syndrome and the middle child syndrome? No, I think I, I just have the, uh, the, the, the baby syndrome or whatever that is where, where, you know, you're just super spoiled and entitled. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I, I give my brother trouble about that all the time because he's the youngest and he gives me trouble because I'm in the middle. So. Now, and see, that's, that's the thing. I, I hear the middle kids are the ones that really have the trouble because they're the ones who tend to be forgotten a lot. You know, and you could dive off into the psychology of that. I'm certain there probably is something to that. You know, my family dynamic growing up, it was it was really weird. We were raised in a religious cult. We were a very fundamentalist religious cult. And so uh, the the middle child syndrome is probably the least of the things that, that my psychologist needs to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point. But, you know, I've... It's weird because, you know, my brothers would look at me as a kid and be like, oh, my God, you're so spoiled to get whatever you want. And then I, I would look at them and be like, what are you talking about? You guys are the ones who got the brand new PlayStation. I just happened to get a $10 action figure. You know, like, I don't understand what you're talking about. You know, long, long story, you know, real quick, long story short, uh, you know, my my mom, uh, my dad wasn't able to handle all three of us together because we would end up fighting. So my mom would just take me with her everywhere she went because my two older brothers got a lot, along a lot better than I did with them. And so uh, my mom and I became really close. And, and what that ended up happening was I'd go with her to the store. And so she'd be like, what do you want? You know, do you want this type of cereal or this type of cereal? And I would always get the cereal that I wanted, uh, you know, and I'd happen to be in the situation where I'm like, I want this action figure. Can, will you buy it for me? And she'd be like, yeah, sure. You're here. Let's do it. And my brothers would never in that situation. So they always think, oh, you got whatever you wanted. But then when it came down to like, the big ticket items they got the playstation i did not they got <laughs> cell phones i had to work for my cell phone you know so it's like there's a little bit of a and, and also because my brothers and i didn't get along that well i think realistically i have more of an only child syndrome than i do of a you know <laughs> it's a really weird dynamic man i totally feel you on that you know we have because we have biological we have adopted we have foster right now we have a a young girl staying with us who is one year younger than our youngest son. And it has thrown a monkey wrench in the, you know, and in such a big family, we're used to that dynamic. She comes from an only child family. They're not used to a kid who believes that they're the center of the universe. In our house, it's more like Thunderdome. You have to fight for the center of attention. And, and so, you know, it it creates that dynamic. And so, yeah, that shifting dynamic is, is always an interesting thing, you know, and I was, I was, not really even joking about the psychologist thing earlier. You know, my wife and I, we lost our oldest daughter a few years ago and we started seeing a guy. I had a guy recommend, um, a friend of mine recommended a therapist to us who, who does grief counseling. He does, you know, among a bunch of other things. But my wife and I talked to him on a regular basis. 
roughly about once a month, we, we still visit with him, even though it's been five years. And it's been a very helpful thing for us. My wife's childhood was very traumatic and she's been able to unpack a lot of those things. My childhood was just sunshine and roses and cult stuff, right? And so I've been able to unpack some of that stuff. Have you felt the need or reached out to, to a psychologist for any of those sorts of things? Do you have a therapist? Is that something that you felt a need for? Uh, if you ask my, my, my friend and my co-host of my podcast, she would definitely say that I need a therapist. Uh, I, I haven't, you know, I've done some therapy over the years. Uh, I, I, I lost my, 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 my mom's oldest biological son was really close with us. Uh, he was always over at the house and he passed away about 13 years ago, 14 years ago now. Uh, and I was really young. I was, I was thinking it was 13 or 14 at the time. Uh, and and so I did some grief counseling through that. And, but I never actually sat down with somebody over the course of, of dealing with uh, this, these weird dynamics that happened to be in my family or trying to come to terms with, you know, being adopted or, or any of that stuff. Uh, so, so I have done some therapy, but in other areas, I haven't really addressed a lot of stuff. Okay. Yeah. That, that's just, it's one of those things that I think, our world is in a place where people are ready to hear that therapy is not an abnormal thing for crazy people. Yeah. Actually, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm a big advocate for therapy uh, just in general, because I, I do think that people um, I've, I've, I've always had a really great support system. And so I think that while maybe I haven't had traditional therapy or, or, or seen, you know, gone to see a licensed therapist, uh, I have spent a lot of time with my pastors and adults in my life who have helped me uh, work through any trauma that I've had as a, as a child. Uh, and I also don't think that my life uh, was really all that traumatic, you know, even with coming to terms with going through a foster, not knowing that you went through a foster care system and coming to terms with that. And then, you know, at some point having to deal with the fact that, you know, you, you realize that, you know, your biological parent didn't put up enough of a fight for you. Uh, and then having to come to terms with the parents that you have aren't really your, your biological parents. Uh, and, and, the, you know, so I, but I think that, you know, for me, I've had enough support system to kind of work through that without a therapist, but I'm, I'm a hundred percent. If somebody out there who's listening to this thinks, Oh, I don't need, I don't need to go to therapy. You know, if Ruben doesn't have to go to therapy, I don't no, no, no. Like, you know, I've, I've done, I have done some therapy, you know, I've done some grief, grief counseling with, with licensed therapists and believe it or not, it helps a lot. Uh, and it helps you understand, uh, the, you know, the processes that, that you need to go through sometimes to actually cope with the reality of your life. Yeah, because there's so many insanities in our head that goes into our into the backside of our mind we don't even realize. And and just to let you in a little bit of one of the things that, that I learned out of out of doing the therapy with, with our guy, right? Is that there's a part of me as a dad, we're wired as protectors, right? That's part of what we do. Yeah, you know, I know you're in California, it's a different world than than where I live here in mid Missouri. Um if, if somebody tried to come through my front door, I promise you as soon as they come to the door, they're, they're going to have some, some hot lead flying their way because I have that close enough by to, to, to acquire that pretty quickly, you know, safely put away and all that. And I've got all the different things that are needed in my life to protect my kids, to protect my wife, to protect my family. We're wired as providers and protectors. And one of the things I did was I did not protect my daughter. I couldn't. She died from a nasty disease. A disease that they don't even know anything about. I mean, if, you, if you've seen the TV show House um, with, um, oh, I can't remember the guy's name off the top of my head now. But uh, there you go. Yeah. And, and he's, he's, uh, he's talking all these different weird, wild diseases. When I saw the episode after our daughter passed away about, you know, histiocytosis, I think was the specific one they talked about. Um, you know, she had a hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. That doesn't even sound real. I, I agree. It doesn't, but it, it took a team of, of doctors to fly out from John Hopkins University just to diagnose her. And, and through, I mean, obviously, there's zero that I can do. 
I had some education as, in IT when I was younger. I have worked in the transportation industry. I've been in the military. I've worked construction when I was a kid. I've worked in food service. Absolutely none of that prepared me to help a daughter who has something that nasty and horrible. But I still, at some level, felt some guilt because I couldn't protect my daughter. And I had a large piece of that that doesn't make sense for me to carry with me. And it took a while to be able to, to work through that and understand that, that was lurking in the back of my head. It wasn't something that showed up every day. It's the same way with, with kids. That every child I've met thinks that whatever they went through as a kid is their fault. With mom and dad divorced, it's my fault. If I would have been a better kid, if I hadn't caused this problem, you know, that, that's what, what we all have those, those weird thought patterns. And so understanding that, that that stuff could very well be in the back of your mind, seeing a therapist to understand that is very helpful in my opinion. Absolutely. I, I have a friend who, you know, won't, won't say her name or any, any details, but, um, you know, I, I tell her, I'm like, you, you need to go to therapy. Like there's stuff that's in your past that you have not dealt with between, you know, a mother who drove you, you know, who literally drove you to insanity. And then, and then a, a father who tried to, you know, essentially lock you down in your house, uh, you know, between school hours, uh, and then also dealing with the fact that you've been in unhealthy relationships since the day I met you, uh, you need to go to therapy, you know? And she goes, you know, unfortunately she's one of those people who who like, Oh, I went to a therapist today. It didn't work. So I'm not going back. I'm like, that's not how it works. You know, like you actually need to go to at least two, you know, like probably at least two months worth of, 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 uh, you know, of 30 minute sessions before you really make any sort of progress in, in the therapeutic system. And, and for anybody who's listening to, to this right now, who's like, you know, I, I've done therapy, hasn't really worked. Uh, I, I would hope that you would examine your, you know, your, your time in therapy, you know, and come to terms with the fact that maybe you didn't do a full, you know, it didn't give yourself enough of a chance in therapy to, for it to actually work. Uh, because sometimes you need you know, there's a reason why when kids go to therapy, you know, they usually have them drawing or playing with blocks or doing something other than sitting on a couch and talking about their feelings because you sometimes need to peel away the reality of what's going on right now to get to the core of the issue. And while you're drawing or, or writing or playing with these blocks and stuff, it helps you distract from the fact that you're in therapy and you're just playing while somebody asks you questions. And, and so as an adult, you know, unfortunately it probably isn't as accepted for you to be drawing or playing with blocks while you're in therapy, but you need to give the therapist enough time to get past the, uh, these are the issues and get down to the, the next layer of what's causing the issues because it's never a surface level thing. It's always deeper than the surface. Absolutely. You know, the play therapy is something we've taken a lot of kids to that have been in our home that if you have a good counselor who knows how to work with kids, play therapy can be really huge. Um, oh, we did an episode a while back with uh, the gal who runs the In My Shoes podcast, and <clears throat> she talks about having taken her daughter to play therapy and some of the things that they were able to learn from it. And it really gave them a real leg up in understanding some of the things she was struggling with to be able to go through it and understanding that the, the issues she was having in life definitely came out of her childhood somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and if you want to see how, how good therapy could actually work, uh, this is partially a joke, but partially serious. Go and watch the episode of the office where Toby and Michael are doing uh, some sort of, I don't remember if it's anger, you know, anger management or whatever, but at one point, Toby just gives him, they start playing, you know, tic-tac-toe or, or, or tech four, whatever it is. And Toby's able to take Michael away from the, uh, the jokes to an actual seriousness of what was going on. So it, I know it's a TV show, but it's a good, it's a good visual of how that works. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's, it's worth so much to, to be able to find somebody who can do that. And, and anybody who's, who's tried it once and it didn't work, one of the key things, I can tell you the first guy I went to see, wasn't a good fit. Mm -hmm. He and I just, it, he was an okay dude. I'm not mad at him. He didn't do terrible. He just wasn't the, he wasn't wired right for me. And I talked with a friend of mine who, who recommended the guy and, um, and sure enough, like this guy is, <laughs> this guy, it's kind of like, if you remember Marty McFly's dad from back to the future, yep. you take him only, he drops the F bomb 
on a semi-regular basis. It was kind of like, huh? But he has got such a such a personality that he and my wife are both able to talk to him and hear what he has to say. And we, we've been able to talk through some things that are really challenging pieces of, of our history. So finding that right person is worth its weight in gold. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and just because, you know, just because a therapist works really well for, for some people, that person might not be your cup of tea, you know? Um, and so you need to sometimes really look for the right fit. And sometimes, sometimes a therapist isn't the right fit in general and, and maybe a pastor, you know, and, and their wife might be the right fit uh, or, you know, going to somebody who has, you know, has gone through those same processes. And, uh, you know, I know a lot of support groups out there do wonderful things for people. So uh, not all therapy is created equal. Oh, absolutely. And not all therapy and not all therapists are created equal. And we all need a specific approach. Absolutely. Okay. I was reading your bio and when I read your bio, I I noticed something about it. It just keeps going. (laughs) And you're 27, right? Yes. You've got quite the bio there. Like, like obviously, however traumatic your childhood was, it has not kept you from being successful. Thank you. (laughs) You know, and I guess guess that's part of what we we do here is, yeah, we tell people stories. We allow people to tell any parts of trauma that they want to tell their story. But I I don't want to traffic in people's trauma. I would love to become a hope dealer. You know, there's a reason why people can, can come out of that and become something, someone, something great and inspire other people. So, you know, first off, um, just I guess the greatest hits album, like right, like like where have you managed to come from in your life after you you've gotten to the point where I guess you've kind of, kind of quote unquote grown up? I don't know what age. I don't think I did that until I was over thirty five, close to forty. But you're there, man. You're there. So so what what have you been able to accomplish that the dreams in your life? Geez, you know, if you were to tell me that, you know, a, a kid from Orange County, California. Uh, who, you know, grew up in a, just a side note, my, my adopted mom was also a foster parent for, I think, 15 years uh, additionally to adopting us and also owned a daycare. So, uh, so there's kids in our house 24 seven. So it's to, you know, for, for a kid in Orange County, California, who grew up in a foster home as, you know, not a foster kid, thankfully, but, you know, being able to witness that who struggled through elementary, junior high, high school, uh, to turn around and, you know, accomplish what I've done. To be honest with you, it's beyond belief. Uh, I started in, you know, all, all throughout, probably starting in third grade, you know, everyone would say, Oh, you talk a lot. You should do radio. Uh, and as my, my voice kind of developed, they would say, Oh, you have a really good, you know, a good voice for radio. And, you know, as my looks develop, they said, and your face looks great for radio too, bud. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, I've, I've always had this kind of calling into the broadcast world. And then in high school, we started thinking about college. And the more I thought about college, I was like, you know what? College isn't for me. Uh, I don't like school. I don't like tests. I don't like homework. Like going to college is just going to be miserable for me. And And so... Uh, one day I was on Facebook and I, I see an ad pop up for uh, the Academy of Radio and Television Broadcasting. And I thought to myself, well, I've always wanted to go into, you know, I've always thought I should go into radio because that's what everyone's always told me to do. So go check these guys out. Started that in 2011, graduated in 2012 with, uh, with a couple of goals in mind. And I always thought to myself, if I could at some point have a conversation with Ryan Seacrest, interview my favorite band. And have somewhat of a successful, per, you know, persona. I would be happy, and I've hit all of my goals. <laughs> um, and so it, it's weird to think that, uh, you know, that somebody who came from essentially nothing has been able to to reach the goals uh, that they've put in their life, and and that really honestly, it it blows me away to think back and, and think about the people I've met and the people I've talked to and, you know, the big name celebrities who know my name and who, you know, consider themselves friends with me at one point. 
uh, it, it's it's a pretty incredible story, to, to be honest. I have to ask, who yes. is the favorite band that you got to talk to? Uh, Alter Bridge. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so to go back to, you know, my brother passing away in 2006, um, at the time, I remember uh, being in middle school and there was a couple of days where um, it was just too hard to go through, to go through the day. And I remember I had a CD player <clears throat> and that's a, that's a device about this big where you put these discs in that play music for you young people. Um, <laughs> And uh, the only CD I had on hand was the the debut album from this band. And I literally remember myself putting these headphones on, putting my head down and crying my eyes out while listening to this record. And by the time the record ended, I had felt so much better and connected to this band. Uh, and that was at 13, 14 years old. Uh, as I grew up and as the band released more albums the more and more i connected with this band there was one album in particular that came out in 2007 uh called blackbird where the 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 title track is an epic nine minute long song uh written about the lead singer's best friend who i believe bought him his first guitar or gave him his first guitar or taught him guitar something like that uh who was suffering with cancer and the song was originally written as a tribute to his friend, basically saying you're going to get better one day. Uh, and unfortunately his friend passed away in the process of recording that album. And his friend was never able to listen to that song. And that song Blackbird um, literally got me through because it was weird because while I grieved that year, six months after my, my brother passed away, I kind of suppressed those, those feelings for a couple, couple years. Uh, when I, when it hit me hard in high school that I lost my brother years earlier, that one song would help me deal with the issues. Uh, so I don't even know why I'm telling you this story anymore, but <laughs> no, you're right. Um, that's, uh, that's exactly the, how that works. We, uh, I lost my father nine months before we lost our daughter and the song for me, the song for me that, that really made the difference was, um, was a song by band. Are you familiar with Greek fire? Greek, Greek fire. Mm -hmm. I've never heard of them. Okay. Um, they, they, they're more popular in Asia, I think actually, even though they're an American band, but one of the, the lead singer of the band, he's on the, on the morning radio show around here. And that's how, how I know of them and, and have heard from him. And he has a song that, that I first found when my dad was sick, you know, and the song of theirs that I found was, is if this is the end, if this is the end, it wasn't invited. And, and like, it just spoke to me and we walked through that. And, and after I lost him in November, literally he was coming home on hospice when our daughter went into the hospital. Oh no. So, so yeah, I had, I had something to, to really hang on to. And in those, in those harder moments, I had something to lean on. I don't think you could have talked to somebody. I don't think a therapist, I don't think a friend, there was nobody who could talk to for it. It wasn't something you could even talk to. It was amazing how, how the music and the lyrics can, can speak to your soul in a way that, that other people cannot. Yeah. You know, it's weird too. Cause I, I mean, it's probably different being an adult and losing somebody. Actually, I know it's different um, because I've, I've lost people as an, as an adult as well, but being a 13 year old kid, it's really difficult. Um, it's really difficult to put into words, you know, the loss of, of anybody. Um, and I know a lot of people who've lost their grandparents, who have lost aunts and uncles. I don't know many people who lost brothers and sisters, you know, at a young age, you know, cause it's not really a normal thing. You know, it, it's, it's normal for kids to lose grandparents. It's normal for kids to lose aunts and uncles. It's not very normal to lose parents and, 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 and siblings uh, at a young age. Um, even though it does happen. So for me, I, you know, I couldn't go talk to my friend and be like, yeah, my brother died. I don't know what to do about it. Cause they'd look at me and be like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what that feeling is. I don't know what it's like to lose somebody, you know? And uh, well, I had great adults in my life. Um, I was always afraid if I told an adult that I was struggling with this, that, that they would, you know, um, you know, report my parents for some, some reason, or, or my parents would be the ones that got in trouble. Like when I went to, into grief therapy in, in high school, I specifically asked my counselor, I said, I do not want my parents to know about this. 
you know, like, I don't, I don't want my, I don't want this to go back to my parents at all because I'm afraid that they're going to get in trouble somehow. Um, and, and so it's interesting, you know, so for me, the only realistic, uh, therapeutic thing I had was this song about death. Uh, and, you know, thankfully for me, I resonated more with the, the lyrics that talked about reuniting with the person, uh, at some point, as opposed to the actual suffering portions of it. For me, it was more of a hopeful thing, but uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it was interesting as a kid to go through that. Our uh, second oldest son, he was, um, he was about that age. I think he was 13 or yeah, he was about 13 when, when we lost Arissa, our daughter. And, uh, you know, he, he ended up in a place where, where he dealt with a lot of mental health issues as well, because it's, man, there, there's not a playbook for that. And you know what, what's, what's, you know, I lost my mother about three and a half years ago, 2017. Um, and again, it came, it came down to where I look to this, actually to this day too. I, I look at my friends. I'm like, you guys are so lucky. You have your, you still have your parents. You still have both your parents a lot around, you know? Um, but the good, the good thing to come from that is, you know, the day that unfortunately, you know, my friends start losing their parents, you know, they will have somebody to look to and be like, Hey, how did you deal with this? Um, you know, because it's, it, it is, it is a different, exp- like, like there's two things that are pr- extremely difficult in life. And that is, you know, losing a parent and losing a child, I think are the two most difficult things. Obviously a child is so much more, to, much more difficult to lose. Um, I saw my mom go through that herself, but you know, it's really, it's really hard. Like you, losing a brother was hard. Losing aunts and uncles were hard. Uh, but, but losing my mom was much more hard, much harder than losing my brother. Um, and, and my brother's death was, was sudden and, uh, unexpected. And my mom's was, um, you know, a long time coming in a sense. Uh, and it was still, it was much more difficult, uh, because I think part of it is you realize, Oh, geez, this person that I've, I've, that, that, that's been there to help me every turn of my life. Every time something, you know, went haywire in my life, she was there for me is no longer there. Uh, you know, the person who, uh, celebrated every victory with you, uh, and then also was probably more heartbroken for you than you were at times of your heartbreak is no longer there. It's a difficult transition in life. And so if I'm able at some point to be the rock uh, or the resource that somebody uh, goes to later in life when they lose their parent or their, you know, sibling, then I'm ready for that. I've been there. I've I've gone through it. uh, And I can, I am definitely somebody who can help in, in, in the future. And it's very important to have those people in your life. You know, what I'm hearing you say is that, that you really did get to a point where you connected with your, with your adoptive family. And I have to ask, has that helped you overcome in some way the idea that, that you had as a kid that somehow or another your, your mom didn't fight for you, that, that, that it, it really allowed you to, to get to the point where you could say, hey, I'm going to become this, this great person. I'm going to become who I want to be. How did you get to, to become that person you wanted to be without having to fight the, the stuff that most kids do when they go through, through the knowledge of foster care and adoption in their history, that adoptive parent seems to be a real strong thing for you? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I would say that for me, the moment where I started thinking that my you know, that, that Angela didn't fight hard enough for me. Uh, I was reminded of the fact that this family fought harder for me than the person who birthed me did. And I, you know, I never doubted, I never doubted that I was supposed to be where I'm at. Um, you know, I, I have a relationship with, with, you know, with, with my, with my God, you know, with, with, with Christ, uh, you know, I'm a, I am a Christian. Uh, and so becoming a Christian really helped me kind of, um, connect a lot of those dots with, with being chosen into a family. Um, you know, cause there, there is a, a big belief that, you know, uh, once, once you accept the Lord in your life, that you are chosen to be part of that family. And so once that kind of happened in my life, 
uh, I realized that there is a power in being chosen to, you know, cause, cause, cause my, my adopted mom, you know, uh, who I, I affectionately call mother, you know, she's my mom, you know, she chose to keep me. She could have easily, you know, if, if I can't, I'd like to actually tell that story. Um, you know, because I was probably about a year and a half when the County came to, to, to my, my mom and said, Hey, uh, we're going to take the baby back and give her, give him back to Angela. She's been clean for a year. Um, she's, she's completed all the programs. She has a, you know, she's been in a, in a stable home for a while now and uh, you know, she has a job. And so I, th- we think she's ready to have the baby back. So just have a stuff packed. And at some point in the next week, we're going to, which by the way, just for people who don't know how this works, you know, when a foster kid is being moved from a home at any point, the, the, the foster parent doesn't always know exactly when it's going to happen. Like sometimes the, the agents, the, the social workers just show up and say, all right, time to pack up the kid, you know, and it's time for us to leave, you know, which is one of the reasons why, uh, you know, so many of the foster kids have uh, those, you know, have their stuff in trash bags as opposed to in suitcases is because sometimes they just show up and you don't have, you know, the foster parents have a chance to try, you know, some foster parents do try to have uh, luggage ready for the kids so that way they can take all their stuff and not be carrying in trash bags. Other, you know, foster parents don't have that that chance. Other kids, they just, they just show up with bags and they start packing their stuff into it. So, uh, my mom had packed all my stuff up and was, you know, uh, was ready for the, the social worker to show up and, and pick me up at any, at, at a moment's notice really. Um, and my mom told me the story, my dad, they were in tears when they told me the story that, that you know, there was a moment in their, you know, in our life where uh, I was going to be taken from them. And, uh, they got a phone call about a week later from the foster, from the, the social worker who said, uh, Hey, um, Paula, are, are you interested at all in, in keeping the baby? Which is me. Uh, and, and my mom goes, she goes, what the F are you talking about? Uh, and she says, well, uh, we tested Angela again and she tested dirty. And so we believe that the judge is going to, is going to actually put the baby up for adoption. And, and my mom, without even a hesitation, said that she said yes, uh, that she would keep me. So when I heard that story, it, re- it just reminded me of, without hesitation, this, this woman who, for all intents and purposes, were being, was being paid, was essentially a gratified <coughs> excuse me, babysitter uh, for me, was given the opportunity to actually be the person who was financially responsible, legally responsible, uh, going to be the, you know, my caretaker and the person who's going to, who has to go to the doctor and sit at the doctor with me when I'm sick, you know, and realizing that she never once not treated us like her own child, uh, was a big, big difference from, for me. So when I had those moments of like, I wasn't good enough for this woman who, who chose to do drugs when she was told that she was going to be possibly getting me back. She gave me up when she had a chance to take me back. Uh, the, the exact parallel for that is a parent who, uh, who was an actual parent who was given the opportunity to take in a child in need jumped at the opportunity and then thrived at being a parent for that person. And then at every chance gave her blood, sweat, tears, and money to, to make sure that kid never went without. I never went to bed hungry. I never went to bed wondering uh, if I was going to, to, you know, uh, be yelled at the next day or beaten the next day or any of that stuff. I was in a very loving home. I was in a very, you know, I was in a very Latino home too, where, you know, you, you did get, you know, yelled at and spanked at when you, you know, spanked when you were uh, misbehaving. But for the most part, you know, if I wanted a sandwich, there was a sandwich to be had. Uh, If I wanted to go do something, there was that route to do. So, uh, you know, so to answer your question, fighting that was the parallel story of that, of being chosen and being taken in and these parents sacrificing everything for you was a stronger uh, connection than this woman who probably didn't want to even have you in the first place, who didn't fight for you. Uh, the story of being wanted was much bigger than that. What you, what you said there that, that really caught my attention, a story we hear a lot of people tell 
is that that feeling of not being enough and it sounds like like that was overcome by the fact that that for someone else you were enough yeah i mean my dad um his name is david he he grew up in mexico and so he never had anything um and when he came to the united states and met my mom he would tell my mom like i just want somebody to call me dad uh you know and when the opportunity to have three boys came came up he didn't hesitate to to adopt us either um you know and you know for me like i feel like that completed my father to a certain degree you know his desire of being a father and then becoming one by by choice in particular as well, uh, completed him. And I think my mom, uh, I think she was, you know, I, I told at her funeral, I said, you know, uh, depending on which person you ask in her life, she was either, you know, a housekeeper, uh, a kitchen, you know, a kitchen worker, uh, a babysitter or a foster parent. But to the people who truly knew her, she was a mother, like her profession was mother, you know, like she, she was doing, she, you know, I would always say that she was doing it as well as, as, as the child who was suffering the most was doing. So if, you know, if one of us was struggling, she was struggling. If, if all of us were thriving, she was thriving. So I think for me, it was, uh, you know, seeing that, that her kids and with my dad, the, you know, his three boys really completed them to, to a certain degree. Sounds like one heck of a woman. Oh, <laughs> She, I mean, there books, books should be written about, about my, 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 my mother. I mean, again, she had six kids of her own. Uh, and when she, you know, when she could have been retired and going to Hawaii and, you know, drinking pina coladas on a beach somewhere, she was raising three kids from scratch again and went from being, uh, I won't say a wealthy woman, but being pretty well off to being dead broke by the day, the day she died because she decided to raise three more boys. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's rough. And, you know, a lot of people ask me, you know, how am I so loyal to somebody who didn't give birth to me? And I'm like, you know, it's, it's not about who gave birth to you. It's about who actually did the work in your life, you know? And for me, you know, this lady named Paula who, you know, uh, was dirt broke for most of her life, uh, built a really good life with her second husband and then sacrificed it all for three kids who weren't her own and weren't part of her family. Like it wasn't like Angela and Paula, you know, were, were family members at some point, they were complete strangers, uh, you know, and she took in three complete strangers, uh, and gave them a home and gave them an identity and gave them the future. And for, you know, now here we are 20, you know, 27 years later for myself, it's up to me to, to make that, you know, make that future a reality that, that she spent so many years feeding into and funding and developing and mothering it. it she is Paula. She is an incredible woman. And, you know, the day that she died, I, I really believe that that class of woman, uh, I believe she was the last of that class of somebody who, you know, recklessly, I mean, not recklessly, fearlessly gave her all for, for people, you know, for, for people that she really didn't need to. You know, there's a saying there that people will, will say to kind of rebut what you were saying, but they just don't understand where it came from. Blood is thicker than water. I've heard that one so many times, but the truth of where that saying comes from, it was, I want to say it came out of the Spartans, perhaps somebody in that era. I, I'll, I don't remember exactly who it was. But what the saying means is the blood of battle is thicker than the water of the womb. The people you shed the blood with, that's a tighter relationship than you have with your own birth family. And that's what, what it sounds like. You know, she shed her, her blood and treasure to, in order to, to raise kids, to take care of you guys and, and dedicated that. And I can truly understand why that, that blood of that battle is thicker than the water of the womb. Absolutely. I mean, for, for, for me and where I stand, uh, you know, people, people would always ask like, and like you did earlier, you know, what's your relationship like with your biological mom? And I'd always reply, what you mean, Angela, you know, like that usually tells people where that stands. Uh, and, and even more so, 
you know, I, I think to myself, you know, my, my mom passed away on her, on, you know, days after I turned 24. Um, she, she passed away on the 24th of January, a day before her 80th birthday. And I think to myself that even as she was slowly dying the day that I turned 24, you know, she still went out of her way to go buy me a birthday, you know, a birthday card and put a, you know, a hundred bucks in it and, and remind me that, that she was my mom, you know, what at the time that I should have been taking care of her. And, and believe me, I, I was doing my best um, where Angela never in, in 23 years, never wrote a letter, never attempted to call. She knew where we lived. We lived in the same house for 20, you know, still live in the same house for 27 years. Uh, never wrote, sent a birthday card, nothing, nothing until my 23rd birthday. And she did. And I, I just threw it in the trash and even open it. Um, so that tells you kind of that story of, of, of in, in reality, the blood, again, like you said, the blood that, that Paula shed for us is much thicker than the water, you know, of, of, of whatever that phrase was that you, that you said. How do you see yourself taking the lessons you've learned from your adoptive parents, from, from Paula and David? And taking that forward into your life to where you can, you can spread that message on after you're gone. That's a, that's a, that's an interesting question. Um, because, you know, there was a while where I, I thought to myself, you know, I can't wait to be a parent, you know? And then here I am 27, not a parent and kind of thinking to myself, you know, I don't really want to be a parent. Um, you know, for me, I, I feel like, you know, when my mom passed away, I, I told people at her funeral that we should all learn to love the way that she loved because it was, she was the type of person who, if you needed something and she had it, she would give it to you. Whether it be writing you a check, making you a meal, giving you some, some clothes, allowing you to crash and shower here for a couple of days, whatever that was, she would do it. And so for me, you know, what I, what I would love to do at some point in my life uh, is, is take the platform that I, that I have, uh, that I've, you know, built from the ground up and turn around and use it to bring some attention to the foster care system because the foster care system specifically out here in LA and I don't know how it's what it's like out there where you live but out here in California it's built around unification um, of, of families even if it's not the best thing for the child as opposed to placing the child in the best possible home and I have I have some some friends out here in California who fostered this kid for three years from birth basically was his they were his parents and he was his child their child to a mom who didn't have a job didn't have a place for the kid to live i believe was was drug addicted i believe the baby was a drug baby at some point um and every single person in that kid's life that had a say in the kid's future said the best thing for this child is to be is to be adopted out to the family that's been raising him. And a judge looked at the, the recommendations from social workers, from therapists, from clergy members, to family members of, of the family he was staying with, uh, to, to family members at churches, letters from people like myself. And the judge said, okay, well, everyone's saying that this kid belongs with this family, but I think he belongs with the mother. And allowed that kid to go back into, again, the mom didn't have a job. She had state provided housing uh, and had done the bare minimum, like like barely passed the classes she needed to pass and, you know, barely crossed the finish line on everything and barely met the deadlines for stuff. Just enough to where the court can say, okay, cool. You, you know, you did what we asked you to do. Here's your kid back. And so I would love to be able to be a voice in, 
and changing the system from, you know, the best thing for the kid is reunification to the best thing for the kid is the best thing for the kid. Uh, because it shouldn't be about putting a child back with their biological parent. It should be about what the best thing forward for this child is going to be because the immediate benefit of being with the parent, yes, could be overwhelmingly positive, but the long-term effect of that could be a strong negative. You don't know who that that biological parent is is interacting with or putting that kid with that could ultimately leave that lead that kid to a life of of trial and and uh, and turbulation and bad decision making because he because the priority of the court was putting that kid back with his biological mother as opposed to making sure this kid was well fed, well educated, well taken care of, well loved, and in a loving community that's going to help build him into a man of the future. So I, that would be my, what I would hope the legacy of Paula and David through me could also be is making sure that foster that the children become become a priority in the system as opposed to a pawn in the system. We interviewed a guy a while back, Dr. John DeGarmo. He's a director of the Foster Care Institute. He, I just saw, was posting something on his, on his social media a week or so ago. And him and, and actress Jen Lilly are in Washington, D.C. right now promoting exactly that idea. And I happened to have an interview scheduled with Jen Lilly, the actress he's working with, um, tomorrow. And that, that I'm certain will be a big part of our conversation because we have seen that as well. I don't always disagree that reunification is is one of the best outcomes you can have. But reunification, like you said, into a safe environment, into a place where a kid is a priority, that's the key parts that need to be taken. And I don't know that you you can you can put markers on that to say, hey, you have to meet these these pieces of our plan and we know for sure then you're gonna do that. It it makes it a really difficult system to to set up and it's probably always going to be flawed and i wish there was a way for us to understand how to how to change that but reunification is always the best thing if if there's a safe and healthy environment for the kid on the other side absolutely you know it's not you know reunification with with a parent shouldn't be uh a job review process you know it shouldn't be okay, cool. You, you grew the sales margins this much and you, you know, you're able to cut costs this much and you were able to do this and you were able to oversee this project. Okay, cool. You deserve your promotion or you deserve your raise. You know, like it, it really needs to come down to all things considered some more times than not reunification is actually a bad thing for the child. Um, because you're, unless unless the the biological parent is able to show that they have fundamentally changed the way that they thought and have put themselves in a position where they're going to be able to provide food and 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 shelter and education and love and not you know not be in dangerous relationships or 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 be with toxic people the immediate again the immediate positivity of being with you know reunifying a child and their their biological mom yeah that's a great thing that's a great thing to put on paper but again if you look at the long-term effect of that a lot of kids who were reunified either end up back in the foster system and and even more so traumatized or they end up making tons of bad decisions because they don't know how to properly uh process the stuff that they're going through and some do do thrive in that situation and some reunifications do end up being a really good thing and some of those do need to happen um but i you know i don't i i I think that we need to stop treating it like uh you know a a job you know a you know a a job review uh, and start really thinking about what's the 20-year effect going to be on this if you go back far enough in our episodes we had i think a three-part episode with a, a woman amy and the episodes are called Hope for Amy. And Amy tells her story. When the police kicked her front door in, they found roughly about $10,000 worth of meth in her coat pocket because she was admittedly a dealer, full-blown dealer. She was she had like state-level contacts and she had been, uh, her, her supplier had been taken in by the feds and they had passed her name on down to the state people who showed up at her house and kicked the door in. And, you know, it was this whole thing. And she finally hit rock bottom. But the thing about her story that was so unique and so worth telling is that 
she realized what she was doing. She changed her life and I don't know, it's been six months or so ago. I saw her post uh, online somewhere. She's She'd hit the two or three year mark sober and clean and she had two jobs and she'd gotten her kids back and she was taking care of life the way that she should. And it was truly a success story. But those stories are fewer and further between than, than we care to admit because when people get hooked on, especially, you know, there's a handful of those drugs that are just, you don't see people come off of well. You know, heroin's one, meth is another. You just don't see people come off of that well. Oh, absolutely. And I, I think a lot of times too, um, you know, the mental health of the parent also needs to be taken into account too, because you gotta, you gotta realize that just because somebody was sober for six months, a lot of that could be because they don't have a child that they have to worry about anymore. So they're able to focus on themselves. And then all of a sudden you throw the child back at them when they're not ready. It's like, Oh my God, I don't know. Okay. The only mechanism I've had to deal with this stress is, you know, doping up. So I'm just going to go back to that. Cause that's what helped. Uh, and then you end up repeating the cycle, you know, like sometimes it does take, you know, consistently two or three years for these parents to really build their life back. And again, you know, the long-term effect of that, you know, you could theoretically permanently damage, you know, uh, the parent's life as well, specifically when it's, you know, a young child, you know, who's having a child. And that's way too common. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, I mean, to, to think that my biological mom had her first child, I think at 12 years old or 13 years old. And the last kid that we know of, she had it like 19 or 20. You know, she started young and ended young. That's kind of insane. Yeah. And, and to also think that, you know, I think she was 17 when she had me. So theoretically, she could have had kids for another 20 years. Uh after after her you know after me at least well it sounds like you're taking taking your experience and really running with that in a positive direction. well thank you yeah I, I i hope so because for me i don't see much in in you know dwelling in the negativity of of, of life you know because for every negative thing that, that you've gone through there should be a couple of positive things that you've gone through um so even even when i you know even when COVID-19 became a thing, and I, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, cool. I lost all my jobs. What am I going to do about it? You know? Okay, cool. Let's start something. Let's, let's create something. Let's, you know, keep moving forward because if you do all the negativity, you're just going to become a, a miserable person by the time that you uh, become a full, you know, a full fledged adult. Well, now I do have to ask because I met you in a podcast group. I assume you have your own podcast. I mean, I'm looking at your setup there in, in the screen, which the listeners can't see, but it looks way nicer than what I've got. So you either have a radio studio in your house or you, you do voiceover work or you have a podcast. I'm guessing it has to be one of those three. Yeah. So I, uh, again, I graduated from the uh, Academy of Radio and TV Broadcasting in 2012. Uh, I've done radio. I've done voiceovers. I've done everything. I do currently have a podcast. Uh, it's called You're My Best Friend, a podcast about life, friendship, and tacos. Um, and it, it, it drops every Monday. You can go over to uh, lifefriendshiptacos.com for more information on that. Uh, well, we just had burritos. <laughs> nice. <laughs> what kind? Uh, well, they were homemade. They were bean, beef, and cheese. And and I made some refried beans here a while back. And, and I'd eaten those for lunch too many days in a row. I decided it was time to use up some of the leftovers. There you go, man. That's that's the way to do it. Uh, I Listen, it might be a, a, a podcast about life, friendship, and tacos, but we do appreciate a good burrito. <laughs> so you're, you're a friend in my book. <laughs> now, I do have to ask, you mentioned you were raised in a very Latino home, and I am terrible at guessing races. Are, are, do you have Latino heritage from your biological side of your family? Uh, I believe so. I believe Angela was, uh, was, was uh, Mexican, uh, and then I... I uh, grew up here, uh, my dad being from Mexico, uh, Mexico, uh, he's from uh, Navidad, I believe, uh, Jalisco, Mexico. And uh, my mom, uh, her father was from Michoacan, Mexico. Uh, and so, yeah, I grew up in a very Latino home and, you know, beans, rice and Jesus Christ, as they say, it was, you know, <laughs> almost, almost every meal was some sort of protein, beans and rice. There you go. Yeah. Well, I would, the, the only reason I ask is because I was curious if you had any of that experience of, of the transracial adoption, because that's that's a, a topic I hear a lot of people talking about right now. And I mean, quite frankly, that, that's a topic in our own household, because I mean, if you look at our family, um, we have every color from slightly darker than me down to um, a sheet of paper white. Well, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm, uh, 
I've had many uh, interracial foster kids that have lived in in the home with us, um, but not not any adoption like that. Um, kudos to you, man, for being able, being willing to also do the inter, interracial adoption because that that's tough. We had uh, my mom had um, the, these two black uh, black girls that lived with us for a little while, and it was very difficult because they were so used to a very specific diet. Uh, and then to get for them to go from that to a Mexican diet was really, really difficult. Uh, and it, it actually came to the point where the county was like, yeah, this isn't a good fit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, if if anybody wants to look at a, a picture of me somewhere and then guess at what the race you see is, it's your guess is as good as mine. I've done the 23 and me once because I'm still curious and I'm still curious because they more or less gave me a um, a list of Europe. <laughs> and I think that there's there's some um, Scottish or Irish in there, and and a decent amount of um, Spain heritage, perhaps. Otherwise, I'm too dark to fit into most of the other categories, but but not quite dark enough to fit into most of them. So I, I'm what I like to call ambiguously brown. So I can <laughs> fall into any people group. I, I I really can. And people make the assumptions that they make, but for the for me that works well for for the kids that come into our home because. I don't have a specific look. Yeah. You know, if I sit down in a Mexican restaurant, I promise you they're going to walk over and start in Spanish. And, and when I took my family down 10 years or so, go down to uh, South Padre Island on vacation, I learned really quick how to say no hablo. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I know that. And I know a couple other things that would probably get you into a good fight. Um, Cause I do have one friend who's, who's half Mexican and he's, I learned enough from him over the years to, to start a good fight, but that's about it. You know, yeah, well, here's a here's a kicker. Uh, a lot of people, you know, if people want to go find me on, on social media, you're more than welcome to. Uh, but if you look at a picture of me, you'd be like, there's no way this guy's Mexican. This guy's named Ruben J. Like, this guy's not Mexican. Until you until you learn the, the full, you know, the full legal name. Then you realize, oh, yeah, this kid's as Mexican as they come. <laughs> yeah, e- even our, our last name does not um, belie anything specific, yeah. I'm pretty certain that I tracked the name down. It comes from Bavaria, Germany. And I don't think I look German. I, You know, I, I don't really know many German people, but I would assume that you came from a palm tree because uh, of the last name. So that, that's where I'm going to keep it at. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, you know, I am i don't worry about it too much. I've spent an entire lifetime not really knowing. And uh, I had a friend of mine, a gal that I met, uh, who li- works in St. Louis City and lives out there one day. And she'd asked me, she says, "What? what are you? I'm like, well, my mom was white. My dad was fairly white. Um, she goes, no, what about your biological parents? And I'm like, that's oh, an excellent yes. question. I'm going to ask my mom. And my mom got a little bit offended when I asked her. <laughs> but but I just don't fit into a category. And so when we started taking kids in, and they actually give us the option, they, do you want to have certain kids that, that you will or will not accept age ranges, um, genders, race, I, and as some people will see that as, as a negative thing, it's a great thing, honestly, because, you know, we had to go talk to some family members because we had some racism in the family and say, hey, here's what we're going to do. But if you can't do that with your family, if you can't draw those hard lines, it's better to be able to say, no, I can't take in kids of a different race because I have family members that that would cause a problem with. That really allows you to be able to keep the kids safe as opposed to, to putting a kid in a place where he's not going to be wanted because we found some of those places. You know, there's there's a little town up just north of us by about an hour or so that, that is still a sundown town to this day. And I yeah, I don't know if you're familiar with sundown towns. It goes way back in American history, but you know, you can you can be in town during the day, but you better have your black ass out of town before the sun goes down. Jesus. And there are still places like that. And I know that because we've had those experiences where we walked in as a truly colorful family. My my wife is her maiden name is McClanahan, so you can guess you know she's got some some real pale skin and, and red hair. And we had a baby with us at the time who was the darkest skinned little guy you've ever met in your life. And we walked into this restaurant and they immediately took us and put us in the back room that was not open yet, plenty of room to sit out front. But they put us in the back room, had to take the chairs off the table. And turn the lights on and basically the, we were shoved in the back room and that's the way that they they operate out there still to this day now i can walk into that town by myself because i have that ambiguity about me but these kids don't have that option and mm-hmm. so it's for us it's not a big deal for some people it is so it's it's always a question worth asking it it, it is worth that and, and again you know a lot of the times too it's like 
you might, it, it isn't a racist thing to ask, hey, are you willing to bring in a black baby into your home? Uh, because again, when it comes down to, or I should say more of a black child, because these kids were, were a little bit older, you know, if it's a baby, you can raise it, you know, with the diet that you have in place. But there are some kids that, you know, at five, six years old, they're used to eating, you know, a specific way, you know, and if you put food in it, have you tried introducing food to a five-year-old, you know, like brand new food? <laughs> You're like, no, I want mac and cheese. You know, it's like, well, this is Brussels sprout or whatever. What I mean, whatever it is, you know, like they're not, kids are not that most of the time are not that adventurous with their food. So, you know, it's important to know that you're going to either understand that, that the culture that these kids grew up in are a little bit different um, or, you know, that they have a very specific you know, way that they are used to doing things. And if you're not going to be patient enough to teach them the way that you do things in your home, it may not be a good idea for you to bring in, you know, an Italian baby into your home or an Italian kid into your home. Who, all they want to eat is pasta all day, you know, and, and you happen to be a, you know, a vegan vegetarian, you know, a vegan gluten-free family. <laughs> you know, that's not a good, that's not a good match. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a lot of pieces to it that, that if you're willing and able it's great to be able to do it. You know, the hair is a big thing. You know, if you, Carl, who came to us, that's not his real name, but the, the, the dark, super dark skinned little guy, he had some of the nastiest, like, like hair to, to manage. It was super coarse. He, even his mama was, would, would say when, when she would have a visit, he's got that nappy coarse hair like I do. It's just, and it was, it was super dry, super coarse, hard to handle, but we had to learn how to handle it. And if you're willing to learn how to how to handle those sorts of things, it can be a beneficial thing. You can learn a whole lot, but it also makes a difference in in who you bring into your home that way. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, again, it's just the same as trying to bring in, you know, trying to become friends with somebody who grew up in a completely different world as you. You know, if you've ever had, you know, the foreign exchange student at, at your school at some point, you know how difficult it is sometimes to connect with them on a on a you know on a basic level. Uh, and if you are able to eventually overcome the cultural differences, then yeah, it'll be a great thing. If you're patient enough to, to learn how to cook, you know, in specific for that child, yeah, it's going to be a great thing. Or if you learn how to do hair management and, and be able to, to deal with, you know, uh, a you know, certain type of hair, it could be a great thing. Uh, but it could also be a detriment, you know, if you're not careful, like, Sometimes the most loving people don't know how to, you know, aren't able to learn how to cater to every single need. So you could be the most loving person in the world and yet at the same time still have a very difficult time raising a child that has a different culture than you. Hair and skin care are two things that we've learned we had to we had to learn a lot about. And to be honest, I found that a lot of the, the hair care products that, that we've used with kids who, who tend to have uh, African-American culture work really well with my hair. <laughs> I'm like, huh, I, I grew up my whole childhood with, with not being able to figure anything out. I just had a ball of fuzz on the top of my head and suddenly I know how to do it. It was a benefit for me. I, I learned that after the fact, after I was grown and, and already finally married and I, God only knows what my wife saw when she saw me. But I know what she saw. I just had left the military. It was a buzz cut. <laughs> oh, there you go. That's why she's that, that's why she's like, oh, this guy's a keeper. And then he grew your hair out. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> So yeah, th those are pieces uh, of that puzzle that, that are hard for a lot of people to put together. And so, you know, the interracial adoption thing can be a real ch controversy and be really negative for a kid if you're not doing it intentionally. Oh yeah, and, and again, like just as simple, you know, it's, people sometimes don't realize that, that even, even when you do something out of love, sometimes it just doesn't come off that way or does not, the effect of it does not end up coming off as loving. So, you know, for those who are doing interracial adoption and foster care, thank you. It's much needed. It's, it's definitely, uh, you know, not, not for the faint of heart. Uh, and, and I appreciate, I appreciate it personally. I appreciate anybody who's doing any foster care or adoption in general. There's so many kids that need, that just need to, to feel love and wanted and, and you guys are, are answering that call. So thank you. On, on behalf of a former foster kid and, and an adoptee, thank you guys. I, I really appreciate it. Well, we all are called to something. And that's one of the things that, that I always like to ask every guest is, 
is what sets your soul on fire. You know, we all have that thing that, that, that we're, we're born to do, that we were wired to do. So what is it that sets your soul on fire? Connecting with people. Um, I, I think that uh, I thrive the most when I'm connecting with new people, uh, especially people who have stories that are that are interesting to tell. Um, my, I love giving back to the community. I love giving back to people. I love being uh, a helper. Uh, when I was when I was super active in the church, uh, I was known as the go-to guy to ask do something because I would never say no. Uh, I since learned to say no. Uh, cause sometimes saying yes to everything is, 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 is worse than saying no to some things. Uh, so that, that's my, you know, that's what I, I live for is to, to give back to people. Uh, and, and even in the smallest of ways, cause I learned in high school that saying hello to somebody can really change their day. Uh, and giving somebody, you know, you never know when somebody who's, who's on their last the last straw before they give up and being that person who says, yeah, sure. I have a dollar you can have, or yeah, sure. Let me buy you a meal or yeah, sure. Like, yeah, I'll listen to your story. Um, you know, you, you never know when that's actually going to change the course of somebody's life. Um, you know, I, for me, I had a neighbor all my life growing up who would always just, you know, subtly tell me, Hey, Jesus loves you. And as I grew older and as I became an older adult uh, or an older kid, I guess, uh, I realized how fundamental those little messages were in my life. Uh, you know, and eventually helped me thrive to become, uh, you know, the person that I am. I had another, another neighbor who every time I had an idea would tell me that's a really great idea. You should really chase that idea down. Uh, which turned me into the uh, entrepreneurial podcaster that I am today. Uh, you know, if it wasn't for somebody at some point in my life saying that, you know, just reaching out to me and saying, hey, that's a great idea. Or, hey, how are you today? I probably wouldn't be as active as I am today. I'd probably just be happy working at the local McDonald's or whatever. Well, it sounds to me like Paula's lessons were well stewarded. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. I hope I hope I... I hope that when when people who knew her and know me now as an adult uh, see me, they go, she did a good job. That, that's, that's really what I hope. I understand exactly what you're saying. Uh, I've had a I've had a few of those moments where somebody has mentioned something about seeing seeing traces of my father in me, and and that's that's always a, a, a feeling down deep that it's hard to put words behind so i'm certain that that she's looking down smiling on you today oh i i I hope so i you know i just it's hard to live up to the legacy uh that that is you know paula my, my mom but um you know for me i feel even if i fall short of her legacy it's still going to be an incredible legacy for myself amen (laughs) <laughs> and you know those those lessons go on and on into history because every person that you touch every place that you go that that message will will live its way out for for decades yet to come even after after you and i are long gone those lessons are are, are touched lives that that will change the history oh absolutely i mean think about the people who you know we, we read about in books who have changed the culture of the world just by being the people that they were you know so every every positive deed that you do in life has a long-term effect and even every negative deed that you do in life just fyi people you know if you're if you're a shitty person like that the effects of that is going to be felt for a very long time so be a better person <laughs> <laughs> i agree with you 100 percent there legacy is a big thing in in my world so uh, i'm i always try to remember that my job today is is to write my obituary mm. and uh that's that's what i'm doing i'm writing my obituary and uh that that's a daily a daily practice for me to to make certain that that it has something positive to say in that obituary absolutely you know what and i look at people who you know in their life you know you wonder you wonder if some of the best actors in the world you know the day they die do they want to be known as an actor or do they want to be as known as the person who gave millions of dollars to the charity of their choice? 
but they want to be the person known as the person who who put a certain somebody through college because they couldn't afford it you know like you know for me i would love to someday be able to set up a a, a scholarship system uh in my mom's name that that helped kids who wanted to go to college but didn't have the resources uh to, to be able to go to college and pay for their books and pay for you know and and really allow that legacy to, to live on through the works that I did because of the person who chose to allow me to be in her family. Well, you know, there's a story I've heard uh, a few times. Um, the inventor of dynamite, when he died, or actually he did, he had not died, but when they printed his obituary before his death, he woke up one day to find his own obituary in, in the newspaper. Oh, and, and the obituary read, the dealer of death has died. And it went on to to basically talk about how he was basically responsible for the death of all these people. And that changed his life because from that moment on, he decided he wanted to leave a different legacy. Um, mm. The guy's name was Alfred Nobel. And the legacy he leaves behind him is not just people dying now. That's where the Nobel Peace Prize came from. Wow. I did not know that. Yeah, that's... You know that that story of Alfred Nobel is 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 well documented. Um, I actually think the first place I heard that was on a podcast. Um, Mike Rowe has the uh, the way I heard it podcast. If you haven't heard that, I, I love that one because it's it's short little 10, 15 minute podcast stories about things that you've never heard of, and he always amazes me. But that one really stuck with me. Mike Rowe, I, got, I, I know I know him, uh, not personally, but I, I like I like the messages that he puts out. He's very, you know. I agree with a lot of what he says. Sometimes you have, sometimes the best jobs in the world is getting your hands dirty, man. Yeah, but I've had some of those jobs and I didn't love them the way that he he managed to make them look good sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would never want, like even the, simp- the simple thing of being a, like a plumber would never want to do. I would never, I do not have the stomach for it. Um, I'd rather be in my little podcast studio making, you know, much less money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. But yeah, if you haven't checked that out, it's a, it's a great thing to listen to. I, I drive for a living, so I listen to a lot of podcasts. And sometimes I'll just go to his channel and turn it on and listen in for a while and see what all he has to say for that day. That's great. I mean, that's a great thing. You know, uh, uh, sometimes, you know, especially in today in COVID, just I know we're way off topic now, but it, sometimes you have to turn off the news podcast. Sometimes you have to stop listening to the news radio station and just listen to some good, positive things in your life just listen find some nuggets go and find out about the nobel peace prize and go find out about you know uh how pyramids were built or whatever like whatever is not about covid19 or whatever you know unemployment whatever go listen to some positivity because it's so easy to be caught up in the negative of millions of people out of jobs thousands hundreds of thousand people's dying you know all the craziness that's happening right now it's it's good to unplug for a little bit. Well, I have taken up enough of your time, man. Um, I do appreciate you sitting and talking with me and telling me your story because I think that's exactly what you bring to this story is is understanding the positivity that's available out there and being able to change the world in a, in a way that's going to to make a difference for forever. Jason, I, I appreciate you having me on on the show, and I, I love what you do. And we're gonna uh, hopefully reach out to you in the next couple of weeks to bring you on our podcast as well because I think. I think that what you're doing is, is wonderful. Bringing a spotlight to to foster care and adoption is huge. I don't think there's enough people out there who understand uh, how how it foster and adoptions actually work. So I, I really appreciate you doing that. We'll talk to you soon. If you made it all the way to the end, thanks for listening in. I had a great time talking with Ruben today. He was a blast to interview. And I did not expect to hear the story of the felonious toddler turned podcaster and radio host. What a surprise. If you have a story that you'd like to tell, please contact us at fostercareuj at gmail.com. If you'd like to see some of our other episodes, hop on over to iTunes or Spotify or whatever your preferred platform is and search for Foster Care and Unparalleled Journey. If you're an iTunes user, it would be greatly helpful if you would leave a rating and review on iTunes. If you'd like to support us, share this episode or another one that you really like with a friend or a family member. If you have a couple dollars that you'd like to hand us a little bit of a donation, head on over and check us out at patreon.com slash foster care nation. 
even if it's a dollar or two a month, that is helpful. We appreciate it so much. If you can't do that, just do us a favor and share this with somebody and help it reach the audience that it's intended to. As always, we put out new episodes every week. You'll find us on Tuesdays. Our new podcast day is on Tuesday. So that's when this one dropped and that's when the next one will drop and the next one and probably the next one and the next one and the next one. Yeah. Yeah. For a while. And as always...